We are here in downtown Gatlingburg, Tennessee at Sugarlands Distilling Company, who USA Today just voted the number one tasting experience in all of the US. They just so happen to make my favorite moonshines as well. You've probably seen them on the channel. Now our goal is to build our own experience and we're really about the experience as much as the spirits we're going to try to produce here at Bruzel. And so I wanted to come down here, I wanted to check out their tasting room. I wanted to see what makes this experience so special, but also we booked the VIP tour. Now they don't have to have any reservations, five bucks gets you a tour. We went ahead and booked the VIP experience. So we're gonna have DK showing us around a little bit. We're gonna learn everything we can about Sugarland. I'm excited about this one, let's get started. DK. Hey Bruzel. How you doing, man? What's going on, man? Good to see you. Nice to meet you. We got our name on the VIP, even Will. Even Will. Will's gonna be our cameraman for today. So we're doing it a little different. Normally it's just me filming. Will's got the camera today so we can get a little more interactive. And he got his name on the board, so he feels special. So what are we gonna see first? Man, so we're gonna go back. We're gonna see our uh, our stills that we opened with in 2014. The still that we upgraded to, upgraded to in 2016. Talk a little bit about mashing and distilling and uh, talk a little bit about where we're going from here. So are these the stills that make all the moonshine? Up until uh, recently, yeah. We just opened a multi-million dollar production facility about 15 miles away from here, okay. which hopefully you guys will get to see while you're in town. But this is where it all started. That's where it all started, right all here. Right. So the whole process starts here. So this is a stone burr mill that was made for us in Austria. She's been the workhorse of the facility since we opened up in 2014. Process here, uh, we get our grains in whole. Primary grains we use here uh, are gonna be three different grains, all sourced locally and regionally for us. We use a white corn, a rye, malted barley. With our uh, mill here, really easy process. You load up the hopper up top. It's gonna shake all those grains down into the interior of the mill. You look down here underneath, there's a, a stationary stone. And just behind this wooden protective barrier, there's a grindstone. And so as those grains are getting shaken down into the interior of the mill, it's gonna grind them up really fine, like a, I think cornmeal or flour, something like that. We'll gather all the grains out of the chutes here on the side. We have bags. And so the back breaking work up until recently uh, was gathering those bags and hoisting them up, up into the cooker. I have the new facility again, which you're gonna see hopefully while you're in town. Uh, it's all automated, so we have augers that take care of all that for us. But prior to that, it was, uh, it was a hell of a workout. You know, just <laughs> getting going in the mornings. So this is a 750 gallon cooker. Heat that up with steam, just like we do all the rest of our vessels in here. Uh, we're gonna heat it up to about 200 degrees. And we're gonna slow cook that for a few hours. What we're wanting to do is soften those grains, the, uh, the complex carbohydrates, break those down into simple sugars so that the yeast has something to ferment with. Once the grains are softened and cooked, we're gonna lower the temperature of that Go ahead and pitch the yeast into the cooker, agitate that, get it all mixed in. We'll transfer it from this vessel over into one of our fermentation vessels. We have these two open air fermenters here, 850 gallon, smaller one, which we was the first one we had when we started with 750 gallons. So then what's gonna happen, the process is about five to seven days. We want that yeast to react with the sugars that we, you know, were able to get out of the grains. They're gonna create alcohol. So the byproducts of sugar and yeast reacting with one another is alcohol and CO2. The mash will create what's called a mash cap that the CO2 vapors are gonna help keep up at the top. Once that uh, yeast is kind of becoming um, a little less active, that mash cap is gonna begin to sink. And at that point we know that it's ready to distill. Five to seven days on that process. Uh, once it's done, we'll transfer everything over to our stills and then we'll get going over there. We opened in 2014, we opened up with a 250 gallon still here. So we're able to put out quite a bit, but uh, realized pretty quickly that we're, we weren't gonna be able to keep up with demand. So in 2016, just two short years after we opened, we uh, upgraded to the 750 gallon pot. Let me tell you, I thought at that point <laughs> we were going big time. To put that in perspective at the new facility, uh, we just started using a 4,500 gallon pot still, largest, largest whiskey pot still in the United States. It's a steam jacket on the pots. So we'll heat that up to 173 degrees. That's the evaporation rate of alcohol. Those vapors are going to make their way up into the whiskey helmet. They're gonna make their way from the whiskey helmet across the gooseneck into the distillation column, which is just above my head. And then in that column, you'll see the five sight glasses and you're gonna have the same exact process again on all three stills. But each one of those uh, sight glasses basically represents a chamber. And inside that chamber, we're gonna condense that vapor back into a liquid form and then warm it up again, it's gonna vaporize, move up to the next chamber and so on and so forth. So every time you vaporize a liquid and then condense it back into a liquid form, that's one distillation. We do that a total of six times. The more you do that, the, the cleaner the alcohol is gonna be, the better flavor you're gonna get. So if you think about prohibition era stills out in the woods, you'd have a copper pot, what they call a thump keg in the middle, and then um, what they would call a worm or basically a condenser 
on, on the other side. And then that worm, a really fancy way of saying a copper coil that goes down through a barrel. They would always find a place that was really close to a river or stream or something where they could pump cold water into that barrel. So as those vapors are going down through that coil, it's gonna condense back into a liquid form and come out on what the old school moonshiners would call the money piece. We call that the spirit safe. So that's gonna be right here. So as the alcohol comes out of the spirit safe, we get to start doing the really fun part and that's tasting and sampling and smelling and feeling and all that sort of thing to figure out what part of the run that we're on. Every distillation is gonna have three parts of the run. You have your first part, which is called the heads. That's gonna have traces of methanol and acetone and all kinds of chemicals that our bodies are not able to process. It's not good for you. If you ever heard of moonshiners going blind or dying, it's because they're drinking that stuff. We don't wanna serve that to the general public, so we wanna separate that out. The middle part's gonna be the hearts. The hearts is where all the good, clean alcohol is gonna come from. That's what we send to blending and bottling at the new facility. And then the last part of the run is gonna be the tails. That's gonna be where all of your fusel oils and impurities and that sort of thing are gonna come through. I did mention that our senses were kind of how we determined what part of the run we were on and when to make our cuts. So what our distillers would do here at this facility, they would actually run samples off of the, off of the money piece, so the spirit safe, by opening up this valve, taking a sample in a shot glass, just like this. They would take the proof on it to know, you know about where we are in the run. You can tell a lot well, based on what the proof is, but also very much relying on our senses. So smell, taste, and touch. So they would smell it if you get the chemical uh, aromas, then you know you're, you're in the heads, okay? If you touch it, then the higher the proof, the quicker it's gonna evaporate on your skin. A lot of people think just smell and taste you know, on that, but funny enough, you can actually tell about what part of the run on by touching it and feeling it. And then the taste obviously is gonna help you know as well. If you're getting nothing but chemicals on your tongue, then you don't wanna drink that. Once that spirit gets to the point to where it's not so chemical smelling uh, or chemical tasting or doesn't evaporate so quickly, we're getting into the middle part of the run, which is gonna be the hearts. At that point, you're gonna get more subtle nuances of grain. Still gonna have pretty high proof ethanolic alcohol, but it's not gonna be so offensive. And then on the tails, the same thing. Once you get to the tails, which is the back end of the run, the smell is gonna be a little bit bitter, or the taste is gonna be very bitter, but the feel is gonna be very oily on your skin. So it's gonna linger for much longer. So have you ever seen any uh, old school moonshine or shaking the glass or sure. shaking a jar? Looking for bubbles. Yeah, you're shaking this thing to death. I can shake this thing all day long and those bubbles are gonna go away really quickly. So I know it's a higher proof alcohol. So when you smell this, it's gonna smell very much akin to fingernail polish, paint thinner, that sort of thing. Not something that you're gonna to wanna to serve to your guests on a Sunday brunch, right? All right, yeah, yeah. that's not great. Not great, no. <laughs> so we wanna get rid of that. Not get rid of it, but we don't right. want it. We don't wanna send it to blending and bottling. Now the heads, this is gonna be the good part of the run. Again, I can shake this thing to death. The bubbles are a little, little smaller, linger a little bit longer, but don't dissipate nearly as quickly. Yeah, so these are the hearts. That's gonna be the yeah. hearts. Can I show you a little trick that we do here? Sure. But when you're nosing something that's higher proof alcohol, uh, more ethanolic, that first nose is gonna be pretty high proof. If you smell your skin or your shirt or something that your nose is used to, you're gonna reset your olfactory and smell it again. A lot more of the sweet grains coming through. Well, okay. So your nose kind of resets. It re resets and then uh, you're able to pick up some more subtle subtle aromas that are in there. And then the last one, again, this is the tail. So just by looking at this, you can yeah. tell that it's- uh, More stuff starting to come through you don't exactly. want. Exactly, you're getting water in there, you're getting infusal oil, some of the things that are coming out of the still, that, you know, grains, that sort of thing. This is what we used to drink when we just like, took a jar and dipped it in mud puddles back home. <laughs> exactly. Definitely not as much alcohol in that. Exactly, yeah, yeah. very bitter. Kind of uh, almost smells like mud puddle water. Like I said, we, we don't want to throw away the heads and the tails. So what we do is we blend those together, we put them in a separate vessel, and we save them for the next run. Because there's still good alcohol in there, you just have to redistill it to get it out. When we put those together, we call them the feints. When you charge your still to get ready for the next run, part of charging it is putting the feints in there and then put your mash in there and get it going. What that does is it increases our yield and creates consistency in our flavors of our products. All right, so we have the tour of the previous distilling setup. I mean, they've got the big upgraded setup. We're gonna go check out here just a little bit, but now we are on our way over here to the tasting room, which I'm excited about. Like we wanna learn more about this tasting room experience. But they did say, if we came up with a fun moonshine flavor, they would make a Brusel special moonshine. That was what was said, right? Did you commit to that? Who's, who's the person who it commits? It's very doable. No. Okay, now y'all can't be too silly about it, but let me know in the comments right now, what should the Brusel moonshine flavor be? We're, we're trying to figure it out because they've got a lot of the flavors I love, they already make. We can't steal an existing flavor. We gotta come up with something unique. Y'all let me know down in the comments. We're about to go try some Roaming Man. This video is being brought to you by absolutely nobody. We don't have a sponsor for this video. So the team said, why don't we just promote our own stuff? And we've got these cool shirts, like these Bourbon Hunter shirts right here. The horse collector shirts. We got leather patch hats. Of course, Glen Cairns with Brusel on them. 
But realistically, we have to sell a hundred shirts to generate the same amount of revenue we do by just doing an ad for a sponsor. And I just told them, there's absolutely no freaking way that people are gonna go to brusel.com and buy a hundred of these off this one video. So there's not a sponsor for this one. I appreciate y'all watching regardless. And if you want some of that stuff, check out brusel.com, help us with our bourbon budget. So we are trying five different roaming mans. Is this every batch of roaming man ever made? No, these are, these are our five most recent releases. Okay. We started about eight years ago doing roaming man. We went from obviously from release one up to 16. We do our new releases every six months. Only thing we don't change in it is the mash bills. Mash bill stays the same. It's based off of our Jim Tom's on a dry moonshine. 51% rye, 45% white corn, 4% malted barley. That stays the same with every release. As we go through the releases, you'll notice different flavor profiles in each of them, different proofs in each of them. We'll manipulate things in the releases other than the mash bill, barrel sizes, how long it's aged, things like that, and that'll give us different flavor profiles for every release. Our primary goal is to make sure every six months when we come out with a new release of Roaming Man, it's completely different than anything else that we've done before. So these are all gonna be unique flavor profiles, unique proofs, all very different flavor profiles in them. So you want every one of them to be Absolutely, completely that's how we get our regular customers to come back. We've got guys that, that collect this stuff that have bought every release since we first started doing Roaming Man eight years ago. It drives our customers to come in every six months, get the newest releases, see what the new flavors are all about, see what it tastes like, all that kind of stuff. That is our primary goal is to make every release unique and kind of a standalone addition. Typically, how big is a batch? They'll range anywhere. Our biggest batch was 40, 53 gallon barrels. Our smallest batch so far was 20, 25 gallon barrels. And that one actually got split in half to do a bonded whiskey and a cast strength whiskey out of those same 20, 25 gallon barrels. Very limited, very limited, extremely limited. And I tell some of the folks that come in all the time, that's the only drawback to me with small batch whiskeys is if you find something you really love, you better get it while you can get it because once it sells out, it's gone. Now, is there one of these in particular that you, you think's the best one? To me, I'm really drawn to the 16 cast strength. I okay. think it's probably one of our better releases. It's probably in my top four or five all time. And that's gonna be, is that the last one? That'll be the, the last most one that we'll try. That's the latest release, release. yeah. Okay. Our latest releases is 16 and 16 was the one that we, we did the 20 barrels, but we split it in half between a cast strength and a barrel proof. So half of it is cast strength, half of it is bonded? Yes. Okay. We aged it four years one month, the four years five months. So that way all we had to do was just take it and proof it down to 100 proof. Cast strength came in at 111.5. So to make the bonded, all we had to do was proof it down because it was already aged over those four years that we needed to do. Now, I've, I've been hearing rumors that you've got a 10-year release coming. You know what? I personally just started hearing about that in the last week or two, and I'm super so you excited haven't tried about it that. Yet. I, oh, no, I haven't tried okay. it yet. I'm excited about it, though, and that's going to be kind of to celebrate our anniversary opening as a distillery which is coming up next March. We'll be open 10 years come March. Well, let's get to drinking. Absolutely, buddy. We'll start you off, and we'll go down this aisle okay. and down this aisle. We'll start you off with release 13. 13 is going to come in at 108.2 proof. Now, the label itself is pretty cool. Handwritten proof and percentage of alcohol. Cast strengths. Only one you'll drink today that's not cast strength is the 16 bonded. Back side of the label is where it really gets interesting. Every label's got our mash bill. It's 51% rye, 45% corn, 4% malted barley. 34 barrels in this release. Filled between January of 2017 and July of 20, or 2019. So it took two and a half years to get this. This is a bunch of different runs, different areas of the Rick Hops that these barrels were put in at. Three and four chars inside the barrel this release is a combination of 25 gallon barrels and 53 gallon barrels. Every bottle's got a handwritten bottle number on it. It's American white oak cast that we age it in. This particular release was aged from two years, nine months, up to five years, three months, because it was filled over a two and a half year time frame. They're all very, very different. It's got a little more spiciness. What's the proof on that? Man, that's hot. 108.2. That came across a lot hotter than I thought. It's really nice though. For a rye, if somebody just handed me that, I'm not sure I could peg it as right, a rye. It drinks, Maybe a high rye bourbon. Like right, it, it drinks more like a bourbon. And I I go through that a lot of times with folks that will walk up to the bar and they're like, oh, you guys got bourbon. And I'm like, no, it's rye whiskey. And they're like, oh, I don't do rye. I'm like, you'll do this rye. It's not going to be that punchy, real hit you in the front of the mouth, pepper grain earthiness, much smoother, softer flavors, really bold, rich tones, not something you would normally associate with a straight rye. What are we looking at here? Next one is going to be release 14. It's going to okay. come in at 111.1 proof. A little more heat on it. 37 barrels filled over a four month time frame. This one's all 25 gallon barrels. So okay, a little so all bolder small barrels. on the flavors. Three years, one month to three years, six months. It tastes a lot more mature than that. Went in the barrels at 108.9 proof and we had a 24.8% angel share on that one. This tastes a lot more like the one I have. We normally speak ill of small barrels. I apologize to all the small barrel people out there because lots of times 
we get bourbon that's aged in small barrels, you just get a lot of bitter oak tannins. And so you right. may get the raisin, you know, kind of kind of stone fruit flavors. Absolutely, yeah. The date flavors and things, but you also just get a harsh oak that tannin. Harsh bite. But I'm not getting any of that here. That's our air dried barrels that we talk okay. about. Okay, so that's the Less difference. All, yeah, when that barrel air dries, the 25 gallon barrels air dry for an entire year. Our 53 gallon barrels are air dry for two years. And what that does is that slowing down of that evaporation of the liquid out of the oak pulls all those tannins, all those off flavors out of it. That's why we get those really smooth flavors out of them. Next one up is going to be our release 15s, 107.5 proof. Same mash bill, 32 barrels, filled over a two and a half year time frame again. We're back to 25s and 53 gallon barrels blended together in this release. And it was aged three years, eight months, up to six years. On the nose, this one has a lot more tobacco notes yeah, on it. Yeah, it's a lot softer tones yeah. than this one. This one. This one is the one that my bourbon and scotch guys are really drawn to. Oh, that's that's the best one so far for sure. Batch 15. That's 15. This is the one I got to take home with me, right? I haven't tried the... You yeah, say 16 is the best. Yet. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's really six, good. If 16 is better than that, we're on the right path. In my opinion, it just it gets is. better I like it. I like yeah. it a lot better, yeah. Now, first one we're gonna do is the 16 bonded okay. at 100 proof. And the reason we were able to do the bonded and the uh, the cast strength out of the same 20 barrels, we aged it four years, one month, to four years, five months. So we're over that four year minimum to do a bottle and bond. It's in a bonded rick house. We're doing it all from grain to barrel. So we got all of those things that we're doing that can make a bonded whiskey as well. So this one, all we had to do was proof it down to 100 proof and put it in a bottle. So we've got a bonded edition and a cast strength edition out of those same 20 barrels. Yeah, we're definitely stepping back up that stone fruit yeah, flavor. Yeah, absolutely. All 25 gallon barrels again, too. I still think I like that one this much better on the bonded, but the cast this, strength's where it's at. The cast strength is okay. my favorite of everything we've got on the shelf right now. It's a little richer and darker than that 14, which I like a lot as well. Comes in at 111.5 proof. All the other information on the label is going to be exactly the same, because all we did between the bonded and the cast strength was proof the bonded down to 100 proof. So still the same 20 barrels, all 25 gallons, 31.9% evaporation rate on it too. I'm sure somebody in the comments right now is like, why is he doing that to the glass? I'm trying to coat the glass to get a little more aroma on it here. And you will notice real strong legs and a very thick viscosity to it. There's lots of oils left in it because we do pot distillation on the Romy Man whiskey. That has everything I like about that one, but the flavors are a little more intensified. Yeah. What we've learned is apparently how you treat your small barrels before you put whiskey into it is important. I think maybe I like this one better. I like 13 better than 14, but then 15 and 16 are just better than those. There's going to be somebody out there that this is not for. There, there's, oh, you know, no, it's no, not no, for no, everybody. Absolutely, but absolutely. if you like it, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Yeah. There's you, no, I don't you, think there's a like it. It's black and white. There's no gray area with that one. I've never had somebody drink 16 cast strength and go like, well, it's okay. So I need to, they're over there. I just grab yep. as many as I want, put them in my, as, as many as, as I can want. hold in my pocket. There is you that, go. Is that the rule? Yep. There's a bunch of SEC folks here. And then I was just introduced as an Auburn fan. Nobody, like not many people are an Auburn fan. That's what most folks don't realize. Like if you're born in Alabama, you're an Alabama fan. Like you just, and you get all your self-worth tied up in your football team. If you're from Florida, you might pick one of several teams depending on where you're from. If you're an Auburn fan, you have connections to the school in some way. Somebody went to the school, you happened to be born in Auburn maybe, but like your grandpa went, you went. There's not a lot of people who are Auburn fans. They're Auburn alumni, they're people who are connected to Auburn that love it. There's not a lot of Auburn fans. So what, what are you? What are, what's your What's your team? Well, I'm originally from Louisiana. Tennessee Vols are my team now because I live in Tennessee, but I'm a huge LSU fan. I'm also a very big baseball guy. And I'd like to point out to you who the collegiate national champions are right now in baseball. Here's what's funny. Uh, is LSU the collegiate national? LSU is the, the, cl LSU's the collegiate national champions in baseball. Yet, nobody cares because I didn't even know. <laughs> Win it in a real sport, you know? Like, I know there's a lot of people right now that's like, baseball's awesome. I love baseball. We're in the South. I'm in Alabama. My high school didn't even have a baseball team until after I graduated. Not a super popular sport in the South. It's, it's definitely not every man's sport. You need to be a little more sophisticated to appreciate it. Oh, 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 oh. He went right at us there, but also <laughs> completely on brand. If you watch this channel, you know I'm not that sophisticated. So they just poured me a little special edition right here. Um, apparently they did the honey cask finish here. That's fantastic. It is a wet barrel. Like that is a, there was a lot of honey in that barrel. It's very honey forward, but the honey forward goes great with the stone fruit flavors. So if you get a chance to find one of these special edition, don't call me or honey cast finish, I strongly suggest you grab one. Now we're probably actually going to try some moonshine. So let's head over there and do that. But what I like to tell people about this whole experience is, is like all three bars are the same. The only thing different you get is the personality in the middle. Like if the personality's not good, can we go to that bar? Unfortunately not, you stuck with the personality you get. So what happens is, 
is you'll get 12 shots of moonshine with me today. We're gonna start right here with Jim Tom. We'll go down a straight line. We'll finish with Butter Bacon, okay? Normally I tell some rules, it'd be like, don't share your cup. If you share your cup, I have to kick you out. Uh, if you don't want anything, take your hand and cover your cup. I won't pour it. Other than that, we all drink together, have fun, okay? Well, actually you're gonna get 13 instead of 12, okay? This comes from our cocktail bar out back. It's pineapple upside down. It's butterscotch gold moonshine. Rest of it, pineapple juice. And then you'll finish it off with a dab of grenadine. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Up next, starts the list off. We got Jim Tom, unaged rye. This is our 100 proof, straight up rye whiskey. It'll put hair on your chest and your husband's too. Make you sound a lot like Ric Flair. Woo! It's live for the color! Woo! This is what you use to make the roaming man. Yes. It sits in a barrel for like three to six years. It does its thing, it ages, and then we do some fancy stuff to it in the back, and then it's an award-winning roaming man rye whiskey. This is something brand new, kind of, at the beginning of the year. It's one of my favorites now. It's our sour blue raz. I like to mix it with blackberry moonshine. A Hawaiian punch in a hot tub. It's good as an ingredient. Yeah. Not I think a... it's better as a mixer than it is a straight yes. up. This is the Grand Am Mall. This is the best selling moonshine up and down the strip. It's so good, it's in a For moonshine a hall of yeah. fame. If you go anywhere else, they make the same drink with Macintosh apples and cinnamon. We don't do that here. We're like two chains. We're different. <laughs> All right. Granny Smith green apples, caramel. We chop it up. We distill it a bunch of times, make it taste super fancy. Uh, if you want to mix it with anything, don't. It's already perfect. It's like a Hannah Montana song. We're getting hit with the best of both worlds. When you drink it, you want to pick it up and smell it first, all right? And then you knock it back. As you exhale, it's caramel on the back end. It's magical moonshine. He's right, like that's the best moonshine there is right there. Only one on your list, technically not a moonshine. All right, just kind of like hopped on a moonshine train. Hazelnut rum. Also, I can give you some advice. Uh, always remember, Hazelnuts will cost more than deer nuts because those are under a buck. So First this time is, I've had that one. It's interesting. Hazelnuts really good. Uh, I like to mix it with Coke a lot. Uh, do like rum and Coke type things. Uh, really good, Dr. Pepper. My favorite in the entire building is 70 proof root beer moonshine. It's gonna taste just like root beer. It's even gonna give you that root beer fizz at the end. Uh, you should go to Walgreens next door, grab you a 20 ounce bottle of A&W, dump it out, fill it up with root beer moonshine. Ripley's over there, they're gonna see all kinds of won't believe. It's gonna taste like a uh, root beer barrel candy, kind of like a gumdrop. Like seriously, that just that's just root beer. Peppermint. This is uh, used to be a Cole Swindell flavor. It's no longer his anymore. All Why right. not? I don't know, to be honest. 100 proof. All right, when you drink it, you wanna take a deep breath in, exhale through your nose. It's gonna turn your 100 into a 70 and make it real easy going down, okay? Oh, the peppermint's so good. So I'm gonna leave a little bit for this uh, dark Got chocolate. To, yeah, okay, yeah. so uh, your last four, they're all dairy. You're really? lactose intolerant, to hell with it. Take it anyway. Yeah, not. A dark chocolate coffee. This has got mocha in it already. Yeah, the coffee's not my thing, but it's really good with the peppermint. Peanut butter, fantastic. This is like Miracle Whip on Wonder Bread. It's amazing. Uh, so good. All the creams, they have a shelf life of two years. So if you buy one and crack it open, it drops down to six months you have to keep it refrigerated. If it takes you six months to finish this jar of moonshine, you should just buy a damn t-shirt instead. Brunch in a jar, we're sponsored by Kellogg's now, so we're a big deal. Maple syrup waffles, it's like if you took mini frozen waffles and you squeezed a whole bottle of Angel Mama on top. The Eggos, that's, that's still weird to me. This is our last one, all right, it's butter pecan. Do not call it pecan. That's what truckers use to use the restroom, and that's pretty gross. All right, and that's the end of your drunk journey, my friend. Thank you. That's for, the end of it. Thank you for spending your time with me. And if you got questions, I'm not the employee you're looking for. <laughs> All right, so we had a little lunch break because we've been hitting the moonshine hard this morning. Now we're here at their facility in Kodak to actually see how whiskey is made. This is not open to the public, so y'all are not going to be able to tour this, but let's see if they'll let us in. Come on in. All right, here we go. So what are we gonna see? Oh, we're gonna show you how we make Rowing Man. We're gonna show you how we make our uh, Sugar and Shine moonshines, our creams. This is a museum piece. This is, I just this put was, this in the truck. Yeah, this, this is what we developed our recipes on. First stop in the process is our, our bottling facility. This is a big step forward from hand labeling every jar like we used to have to do. This is our rotary filler. So it's an air purge and then the jars come off. They go through the, a rotary filler and then a rotary capper. And we have the finished product. How many bottles an hour can this thing so it does 72 a minute. I need one of these right here. That's what I need. I don't know what I do with it. I'm not, I don't need any, I don't need 72 a minute of anything bottled, but I want one of these. So this is our 50 milliliter bottling line. That's our airplane bottle. We'll show you later in the tour where we're commissioning our new line that looks a lot more like that. It'll do 150 bottles a minute. Okay, next stop, we're gonna go out and see where we bring the grain in and take you through the whole process of, of making Roaming Man. Yeah, honestly, this is a lot bigger scale than most of the craft brewer or distilleries 
that we've been to. This is a lot more automated, lot lot bigger production. Are the that's the steel? Yeah, it's Jeez. the biggest pot steel. What, in the do we, does States. it have it? You call it Goliath? Does it have a name? We haven't named it yet. Okay. We got to come up with a name. Right. This is our milling room. So we actually use a cage mill as opposed to a lot of places use a hammer mill. Hammer mill, we feel like beats the grain up, whereas a cage mill, it's run on differential uh, power. So it's just a little gentler with the it's grains? It's much gentler and you get a very consistent grain diameter. How does the grain diameter play into the product that you end up making? Well, it, you know, you're exposing the starch to enzymes to convert it to sugar. You want consistency. You don't want some that's you know powder and some that's bigger. So the size has an impact yeah. on how and efficient then, that can be converted to alcohol. And also, the hammer mill produces a lot of heat, so you're heating that grain. How long does it take you to grind a, uh, a that whole bin full of corn? Well, we don't. So we do it per uh, recipe. So and you just get however much you need here, exactly. not how much. And you it, have. Weigh, it weighs it out. It's automated. We ferment for a full seven days. We do that because. We like to build certain acids and, and bacteria in the in the fermentation to add uh, congeners to the uh, you know to the process. We feel like it gives us a more flavorful whiskey. Is there a difference between say a rye whiskey, a bourbon, and a moonshine, or are they all just going to ferment about the same amount? So of we time? we ferment the same. Largest pot the still. Largest period whiskey pot still in North, in North America. America. What do you, you say? Whiskey pot still. So Is there a larger we're pot not, still? We're for, not clear on whether there's a bigger rum pot still. We're, okay. That one we're still. So you don't to know. Out. You might. You might still be. You haven't found somebody making hand sanitizer with a bigger pot still or something. You still might yeah. have the crown. We might, okay. we might have it. Nobody builds this big a pot still. A column still, you get over 90% of the alcohol out of the mash, so it's much more efficient. It gives you a cleaner uh, distillate. That's not necessarily what you want in a whiskey, though. There's a lot of different things going on in the barrel, and so you want to have a little bit of a little bit of, of everything in there. And so a pot still, you know, just like with a scotch, and I know you're a huge scotch fan, just like with a scotch, you know, a pot still gives you a more complex uh, flavor profile. Problem with it is you get less than 60% of the alcohol out of the mash. Right, not so super it's much efficient. less efficient. Better product, not as efficient. We feel in like In your it opinion. Is. The important thing about a cook is hitting temperature, hitting certain temperatures and hold periods because different enzymes activate at different temperatures. We step through that whole process just trying to you know, trying to get all the starch in the in the in the pot converted. So how long does this cook? It's about an eight hour process. And then you just pump it into one of then these we just to start fermenting. Into whichever one, yeah. How many gallons do you say this was? This one is about nine thousand gallons. Yeah, Trent's our resident mad scientist. He's got a, a master's degree in food science. He's a published author in, in Lincoln County method and, and uh, yeah. eight barrel aging. It was so, the first research done on the Lincoln County process in 108 years. The first published research done. For, yeah okay I, we have a feeling that there's a there's a, a company in middle tennessee that's done a fair amount of research on it so what i did is i did chemical analysis on all of the odorant so the smell chemicals in the distillate before and after that charcoal melling to see what effect it actually had on your distillate he has a paper published this guy wrote the book on the lincoln county process is jack daniels a bourbon legally yes it cannot have flavoring added Lincoln County process, per my research, is only subtractive. It takes stuff out, doesn't add anything. There you have your answer. <laughs> I'm cooking this. I monitor our distillation, our fermentations. I do all our blending of the moonshine. It's not just me. We're a team, but I, I'm part of every step from grain to bottle. What better way to tour a distillery? Okay. Some whiskey in your hand. There you go. So what do we have I here? I just found the six-year. Six-year Roaming Man right here? Cheers. Ah, oh, that's much more fragrant than the 16. You get a little more, like, rye spiciness on it, but not... I mean, definitely not overwhelming. That has a lot more spiciness going on than the ones yeah, we does. tried this morning. Yeah. So this has been uh, fermenting for a couple days. Most of the fermentation happens in the first 72 hours. Yeah. And then you're pumping this straight into the still pumping from here? straight into the still. 4,600 gallon pot still. It's an exact replica scaled up of our original 250 gallon pot still. If it's a pot still, and you got another pot still, but it yeah. looks different. Like, how does that, how much of an impact does that have? Well, it's all about, you know, the reflux. How many times that that alcohol is having to escape the liquid before it gets out to the end of the line? Right. The more it has to do that, the purer it gets. So if you had a different design, it may come out a little higher proof, a little lower proof, a little... Just different. Like, yeah, just yeah, different. I, I don't think anybody could tell you how different. So we run a hybrid system. It's a pot column hybrid. We distill once through the pot, but then we, we come over and we have a four plate column. A lot of companies that, you know, we've toured so far are using column stills. For whiskey, 
Why do you think a pot still is the right choice? We think it's the right choice because you get a broader variety of components in the whiskey. When you run a big column still and you'll run at you know, 160 proof all day long every day. Here, we go through our heads and then we make a cut. We collect our tails and they go we start collecting at about 140 proof down to about 90 proof. And so we're getting all kinds of different stuff. So we go through our column and then down through the condenser and, and here's, here's where the good stuff's coming off. Back in the old days, you had to have a, a place where you could proof it. The pipe coming up, you'd shut off flow so it's not pushing it up and you drop a hydrometer in it. Now down below, so that's it's all our- charcoal uh, filtered. So y'all are using the Lincoln County process then so for these? So only or? for the Tennessee whiskey we make. Okay. This is where we process our whiskey. When the whiskey comes off the still, if you want to step over Which here- is, The still's right on the other side of this wall. on the other side of the wall. It comes into one of these five tanks. The tanks on the right are our faints tanks, so the heads and tails. Those get recycled into tomorrow's batch. The tanks on the left are our hearts tanks. So we'll proof those to whatever proof we want to do our barrel entry. Typically we're between 110 and 115 proof. So this thing works basically like a gas pump where it detects the fill level on its own and it's gonna flow liquor into the uh, barrel. And then once it gets to the correct level, it would automatically just come up. And that way I can get it started filling, walk away, do something else, get some of these barrels conditioned instead of like how we used to have to do where I had a pump and I had to sit there and manually watch it. This is a 53 gallon barrel. Typically we see about 51 in a barrel. From the ethanol tanks, we'll proof those down. We like our whiskey uh, to have a barrel entry proof of between 110 and 115 proof. So then they go into these barrels and, and we use very specific barrels. The requirement for our barrels is the staves have to be seasoned in the yard for 18 to 24 months before they ever make the barrel. So let's step into the Rick House. We made rye whiskey exclusively until we started experimenting a couple years ago with a Tennessee whiskey. Then this year we put away a wheated bourbon that we're really excited about. Now is there any particular reason you started with rye? Is it just because you had the moonshine and well, it's like let's do it? Or? So we started with a rye moonshine. We knew that we were doing a great job distilling. We were getting some, uh, you know, some of the big uh, whiskey boys were turning their nose up at the little moonshine distillery and so we said you know something, we can do that too. And so we just, you know, we, we took the thing that was at hand and we knew how to do, which was a rye distillate and we put it in a barrel. So that's how it started. So we got a weeded bourbon here and we're excited to see how that turns out. We, we feel like it's gonna take longer to age that. Rye typically ages a little quicker, just the nature of the grain. You know, we're six months into this experiment. So the, the oldest weeded bourbon on here is six months old. Yeah. So you won't know for years. We won't know for, that's the beauty of whiskey. <laughs> so at this point, it's just keep trying it every year until yeah, it's we, ready we, to release. And you know, hopefully the barrel's not empty by then. That's the hard thing about starting a whiskey company. It takes five years to find out if you're any good at it. Where are we taking Roaming Man? You know, we, we're always working on, on new mash bills. Eventually, we'd love to have a single malt. So. You count me out on that one. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you know, no, I'm you gotta have some, something for Pot everybody. Still malt, not my thing. Yeah, gotta have something for everybody. Like Roaming Man is in little pockets in four or five states around the country. Our goal is to have it in four, the continental US within by 2026. So we're gonna go from the 375s to 750 milliliters. Yeah and then a bunch more of it. We've had a great time here at this facility that none of y'all are gonna be able to see, but also over at the uh, Sugarlands Experience in downtown Gatlinburg. Didn't realize how big of an operation this was, to be honest with you. They make all of my favorite flavored moonshines. It's the best product on the market to me. And honestly, we've been doing videos with their stuff for long before they reached out to try to do anything together. Happy to hang out with folks that are making cool things, but also for us to learn from so that someday we might be able to do our own thing. So I appreciate all of y'all watching and we'll catch you in the next one.